Hi, I'm Dr. Anjali Bagra, an internist at Mayo Clinic with specializing in stress management and resiliency. And I'm Dr. Susie Mosler, an anesthesiologist specializing in pain medicine. Joining us today is Dr. Lois Kron, member board of governors at Mayo Clinic and recently acting CEO of Mayo Clinic Arizona. Thank you so very much, Dr. Kron, for joining us oh. at the GRID podcast. It is my pleasure. Well, we're so excited to talk with you today and looking forward to your uh, presentation as well. And can you start off by telling us something interesting or a passion of yours? Absolutely. Gardening is my meditation. Ah. There is something very nice about being outside, surrounded by growing things, nature. And I have to say that here in Ojai, it is absolutely beautiful. What a garden, a stunner. That's true. Uh, that's certainly very fitting for this property, which is just insanely beautiful. And living in Arizona gives you opportunity to indulge in gardening pretty much year round. Yeah, except the gardening there is a little bit more Different. of a defensive sport with a few, uh, <laughs> know. you know, thorns and spikes and things. Sure. It's, it's doable, sure. but you have to be careful. Yes. Well, we are thrilled to have you with us at GRIT. What does grit mean to you? Well, grit to me means inspiration. And I have to say, I have been just amazed at the energy in the room, the number of attendees, the high caliber of the speakers. And this has been a phenomenal meeting. So thank you very much. So I, I would you know, put a capital I in the word grit, but I do like the overall word because it really conveys just determination, um, you know, ad adaptability, but thank you in particular for the inspiration, the I. Well, we are humbled. And that is powerful, and I agree with the, the presence in the room of almost capacity of 400, um, and we've heard that. And, and really, it's, we're grateful to people like you, leaders in the organization who are here. Your mere presence is important and impactful for all of us and for the trainees. And you're at the top levels of the institution and leadership, and you certainly have a lot of lessons and experience to share. Um, can you tell us about maybe some of the ways that you have um, discovered your own style of leadership? Well, I, I'm just going to build upon your comment about you know how important it is for people to get together. Mm -hmm. I personally think that constant renewal is important for leaders or for people who are future leaders and that activities like this where you get new ideas, you have infectious energy in the room is tremendously important. Uh, many people do begin to lose their edge if it becomes a little too familiar um, and they don't have the ability to grow and their resilience isn't tested in the same way. So I personally think renewal is key. I love that. That ties in your gardening and the, the renewal. It um, looks, yeah, it looks like you have many ways to emotionally renew, spiritually renew yourself. And, and that certainly is a model we had in mind when we were building GRIT. So thanks for that affirmation. It looks like it came across. Um, you talk extensively, Dr. Kran, about importance and role of influence in leadership. Could you share with us you know, what influence in leadership means to you? And if there are differences in how women versus men, for example, exert influence in leadership? Well, I do think that one key trait of a successful leader is to be able to influence the conversation, influence the decision. I personally believe that there are many different ways to do that. I do think women tend to do it, by and large, differently than men. And I think you have to be authentic, and it has to reflect who you are as a person, um, the way you operate. For many people, having a robust networking um, system so you can reach out to others and begin to prepare them for the conversation or for the decision is incredibly important. And women tend to do that very well. So that often means that they have outside size influence when it comes to that time where the decision needs to be made. And I think that, that point on networking, and we're, we are good at building relationships and communicating, but maybe not as often asking for what 
we want or I want that's going to benefit or an opportunity. Were there times that you, that, you know, at the role of um, CEO in Arizona, did you learn any new things in terms of how to influence other top leaders or? Well, I, I do think for myself and for many women, there is a challenge with the likability issue. Mm -hmm. And that women tend to value the relationship so much that they will put that ahead of the decision that needs to be made or the action that needs to be taken. And um, I think it's possible to do both. Some of the time you are paying attention to just the relationship and nurturing that. But other times you have to be prepared to take a tough decision. Mm -hmm. And one of the surprises for me is how people are sometimes a little shocked when a woman leader mm -hmm. makes mm -hmm. the tough decision. Mm -hmm. And somehow they don't expect that in the same way that they might from a, a male leader. But I have no reason to think that women leaders can't assess the situation, you know, do all they can to influence the um, dialogue, but then when the going gets tough, make the tough call. Mm -hmm. You know, this came out uh, from one of our other speakers, it sounds like during one of her stakeholder leadership interviews, um, she had direct questions around, because you're so likable mm -hmm. and you have great relationships, how will you take action? Or, you know, it, it just kind of echoes what you just uh, referred to that likability in relationships are part of influence, but women are fearless when it's time to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. And for leadership styles, is there overlap or do you think a predominant leadership style sort of defines a leader? Because in, in my understanding of leadership styles, we tend to fit into pockets of leading by influence or leading by doing leading by creating relationships. I'm talking of the DISC style, yeah, yeah. for example. Do you see there um, being um, a lot of segregation in styles when you lead by influence? So my personal opinion is that the most agile leaders mm -hmm. actually are fairly evenly balanced. Mm -hmm. So they may have one or two of those four elements that's stronger than the others, but that a a really successful leader can sort of be analytic at one point, can be very aware of the emotions of the people involved at another, can be highly compliant and reliable. So these are you know, three of the four mm -hmm. disc colors that mm -hmm. you're relate, uh, speaking to. And I actually think that the more a person can switch back and forth and practice mm -hmm. doing that, and this kind of comes back to the renewal so let's say a person just self-assesses and says, I'm not quite as good with the analytic yeah. as I am with the warmth. Then my encouragement would be, then really try to build your analytic skills. Mm -hmm. I do think effective leaders who are able to make the necessary adjustments are able to leverage different mm -hmm. skills depending on the situation. Um, and so that's what someone should strive for. A leader can be a little out of balance if they are incredibly bold yeah. without the other traits. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and the, it's the same for any one of those elements. So leadership mm -hmm. flexibility, leadership agility, leading to a more situational leadership morphing um, seems to be an effective way to lead Well, and for and balance. For balance and also as a person develops. Yeah. So I think that um, a person who's perhaps in their first or second leadership role will um, have a narrower range of capabilities. But then as the years go on and they have more experience, more confidence, a, a bigger network, they may actually um, do things in a way they didn't do 15 years earlier. And that's just a sign of growth. Um, and I th do think the very best leaders have that ability to change over time. And that's just the wisdom that comes with lots of experience. We definitely, I think, saw someone had a slide with a chameleon and the ability yeah. to, to move mm -hmm. between to the move different between. models for effective leadership. And that, mm -hmm. that renewal, too, as you 
spoke about to keep it, keep checking ourselves mm -hmm. and in different roles and certainly as we progress. Did you, um, this is a little bit of a dovetail off, but um, you know, at these highest levels that you've been at, a lot of times we're, you know, studies show women don't go for the opportunity until we have every skill mm -hmm. that we can imagine mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and are overqualified. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like that was something that changed for you or do you identify with that at all or at a various stage of your career? That's an excellent question. And I have struggled with that where, you know, I sometimes marvel at other people, generally men, who just, you know, lean in and, you know, get involved and then check their facts later. Mm -hmm. Now, um, many times they, they're successful. So research right. is true. But, but, <laughs> but it's a risk. While I, and I have lots of female friends and peers, uh, want to have my, my facts solid mm -hmm. before leaning in. And so I do think that that's a, a you know, pattern that uh, women leaders have to be wary of. And I do hope that maybe the more that's spoken of, mm -hmm. the more women can appreciate that they too can be a little more bold and not have to have you know, their facts triple checked mm -hmm. before they uh, contribute. Don't do it too quickly, but mm -hmm. don't wait too long because sometimes there's just a moment there's an opportunity to change the nature of the conversation. And if you miss that moment, it's going to take more work mm -hmm. to influence it and get it where you think it needs to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talk about the imbalance or gender inequity as we look at higher leadership roles. And you just beautifully summarized how there's need for flexibility in leadership styles. And I sense women want, a lot of women lead by influence and some of the higher roles mm -hmm. perhaps require more leading, driving results. Do you sense, is there discomfort in leaning into that style? Is that a potential barrier that could be contributing to the observed inequity at the higher levels? I'm, I'm curious what your yeah. thoughts are on so that. So I have a slightly different view of that. I do think that you know, outcome-oriented leadership is key, especially when you know their the decisions have more implications, um, have more long-lasting uh, effect. But I do think actually it's the middle where the data-based decisions are very prevalent. When you get to the very most mm -hmm. significant decisions, that's much more about vision and mission and values. And so the, the data matters, but not quite as much as with those sort of operational decisions. Should we do this project or not? Mm -hmm. More, you know, what are we trying to achieve as an organization? What do we as an organization believe in? That then is a little bit less data rich. And that's actually a domain where a woman who's a fairly traditional leader mm -hmm. who may, you know, lead through influence not so much by analytic and data can feel very comfortable once she gets there. She just has to get through that middle zone. Right. Oh, interesting perspective. Yes. What are three things that you, pieces of advice from, you know, it can be from highlights from your talk or that you would give women and men um, of of leadership and influence and maybe even the process to get there? So one that I feel very strongly about is that um, in general, and you know, social sciences have proven this, women are more comfortable with compromise and tend to be less extreme in their position. And I personally think that that is tremendously beneficial that being able to compromise and find the middle ground. You know, we had a session today about negotiating. Mm -hmm. Ideally, it's a win-win where everyone leaves feeling like some of their goals were satisfied, that that's something tremendously important. It comes more naturally mm -hmm. to women and, and the data supports that. So that's number one. Number two is, you know, don't shortchange yourself in terms of what you know, what you believe in. And, the, you know, don't lack confidence in expressing that. Um, that, unfortunately, is a common problem, but it's something mm -hmm. that a person should try as much as possible to weigh in, even if they're not quite sure, 
even if they haven't perhaps triple checked the facts, mm -hmm. but to you know share their perspective because it will be valuable. And then the third is to, as much as possible, be oneself. You know, we had an excellent session talking about introverts and extroverts, mm -hmm. and we all have our natural style, mm -hmm. and we're not going to change that. Um, and so build on that, but do try to renew and, you know, be as agile as possible while still keeping in mind, you know, if one is an introvert, you know, you're going to probably approach it differently mm -hmm. than the person who is the superstar, always has wanted the yes. spotlight, mm -hmm. who is the extrovert, who probably needs to mellow a bit <laughs> in order for the conversation, yeah. the decision yeah. to be as strong as possible. So what we heard you say was lean into your collaborative negotiations, um, remain authentic mm -hmm. to your style, but morph it as needed in your leadership role and then build your confidence muscle. Indeed. Well, wow. Very well summarized. <laughs> well, this has been such a pleasure for us and an honor to have you join us for GRIT 2019 and the podcast. Thanks so very much, Dr. Kron. Thank you, Dr. Kron, for being here. Well, thank you. I greatly appreciate it. This has been a wonderful meeting in a beautiful place. <laughs>